in Warp Zone 3, we got jump scared by spawning right in the middle of a giant biter nest. It turned out to be more of a nuisance than an actual problem, so we just ignored them and did another home mining session, before driving out and setting up another temporary research base. But this will be the final temporary base, as this time we focused on unlocking all the warp factory floor upgrades we need to start off a real warptorio base. So, in warp zone 4 we are going to focus on building up all 3 floors in our warp factory, while attempting to automate the inflow and distribution of resources as best as we can with the limited space we have available. We won't need to run away to build temporary bases anymore, but still we need some resources to build our warp factory, so we start off with the final home mining session of the playthrough. Most of all, we need the one resource we ignored so far, stone. Stone bricks to be precise. We need them for two reasons. We want to make steel furnaces, which cost 10 stone bricks each, and we will need a couple of stacks of walls for a few select military science projects. We won't be mining stone anytime soon again, so we need to collect all the stone we will need right now. Which means we are going all out and place 20 miners on stone, fueled by 25 coal. And those will have to run out completely. We need to protect the stone patch at all costs until all stone bricks have been produced. And since we are out here mining stone anyway, we also set up the usual suspects on the iron, coal and copper patches. This time I do remember I have the warp teleporter. And for as long as the biters are small, we can use it to fast travel to our warp platform. Though I'm pretty sure it would have been faster to just walk to the copper directly instead of going through the warp teleporter. Five minutes in, all 100 burner miners are going again. And we spot that not all biters attracted by the polluting war platform are finding their way to our dirty burner miners. Anyway, the goal of our mining session is to keep all miners active while trying to transport all the resources to the safety inside our warp factory. Where we quickly discover the concepts of warp building. Oh, whoops. Anyway, we will explain the full blueprint later on, but this row of chests located under the teleporter takes up all tiles south of the teleporter. The teleporter spits you out on the opposite side of where you entered, so as we often enter from the north side, that means I should spawn below the teleporter, which would easily get me stuck in the chests and pipe infrastructure next to the teleporter. However, with all space south of the teleporter occupied by chests, there simply is no space for me to spawn there. So we get pushed out in a more favorable location instead, to the left or to the right. These chests will also function as my personal storage for the foreseeable future. So we are transferring all temporary storage down from the warp factory floor above. And with the full factory floor cleared of chests, we can now plop down the final floor's blueprint. The red and green sign setup, which will carry us through the next few warp zones. In the south, we find the assemblers which will make the red and green sign's ingredients, connected to the red and green sign's assemblers on the left, leading into a cute sign's buffer chest area in the north which will ensure science production goes on even if we are researching slow technologies. Or, you know, if I just plainly forget to select technologies to research. 
On the right, we have space for 20 of our 40 laps, which isn't great, but we are simply out of space. So for now, it'll have to do. And lastly, the central assemblers in the northern area are my personal assemblers, where for now we will be making copper wire and iron gears to speed up our handcrafting addiction. Though perhaps making more ammo would have been a better call. Anyway, there is no real base building going on just yet, we are just trying to declutter our inventory so we can transport more resources. And as it turns out, we've already gotten distracted for too long. The coal miners are already idle and the iron mine has largely run out. Meanwhile, attacks are coming in from all sides already, but with small biters we should be good. As long as we keep the turret supplied with ammo, that is. And 8 minutes in, there's still about 10 coal left in the stone miners of the 25 they started out with, so we are going to have to defend our home area for a lot longer than on previous warp zones. Combat may get a little... intense. And this time we see not all of the biters routing to the warp platform are unable to find the miners. Anyway, we try our best to keep the miners mining while transferring all the resources. And making some progress inside. We are gathering stone bricks now, but we are still lacking the other ingredient required to make steel furnaces. Which is, well, steel obviously. So we cram a triad of stone furnaces in each of the four corners which we will use to smelt the iron into steel. While we wait, we start handcrafting all the stuff we need to set up the rest of this floor, which mostly consists of a dazzling color array of different inserters. While we complete the boiler floor, let's get a brief rundown of the mechanics behind this blueprint. We reuse the 8 boilers from previous warp zones and hook them up to 16 steam engines, occupying two of the four corners of this floor. This is a measly 40% of our usual 20 boiler coal power plant and it can provide us with only 14.4 megawatts of power. But still, thanks to the out of the box use of our future warp Dorio feature, which we'll get to later, this little power plant that could will provide us with all the power we need for the next couple of warp zones. Anyway, the other two corners are dedicated to a cool 28 fluid tanks of water storage. Once connected, it takes about 10 minutes to fill up with water, but they will be able to provide the base with power for approximately 45 minutes without outside support. All that water won't do us any good if we don't have the coal to boil it into steam, so the center area is reserved for coal storage. In the future, that coal is going to come in through the harvester floor and flow down to the boiler floor through the two wooden chests next to the teleporter. The priority splitters will make sure that if we have coal incoming, that will be used first, and any excess will flow into the eight buffer chests. And if we don't have coal incoming, the eight buffer chests feed out the coal to the boilers instead. At the moment, our 650k water storage is about 80% full. That will probably be enough to get us through this warp zone entirely. Anyway, we are making the first batch of steel furnaces now. 12 to be precise, which are intended to upgrade the current stone furnaces smelting steel. And we clean up our inventory a bit to prepare for another resource hole. We clean up our inventory a bit to prepare for another resource hall. And we are not a minute too late, as many of our turrets have meanwhile run out of ammo.
anyway, as we refill our turrets, we catch the exact moment the stone miners run out of juice. Which means we are done here at the home area. But with our inventory already full of coal, we can't carry much else inside. So we sprinkle some additional coal over the setup, so we can harvest just a little more. While we start hand hauling heaps of harvested resources. And as we upgrade our 12 steel smelting stone furnaces into stone cold steel furnaces, doubling their speed and coal consumption efficiency, we prepare 32 more miners. Electric miners, that is. That's right. The era of the coal burner miners is coming to an end. They carried us all the way through the first three warp zones, but with the current inflation rates, we will no longer be able to afford the train loads of coal they require to operate. Automation is on the horizon, and Warptorio is a mod where true automation means you will be poor for most of the game. So, trying to get the most out of the hard limit on resource intake capabilities the Warp Factory provides is going to be key. So, now that we're moving towards a factory inside the Warp Floors, we're going to go all Scrooge McDuck on our resource consumption. Not only are we switching over to electric miners, which of course still require coal to operate through the power plant, but approximately three times less compared to burner miners, we are also going to skip a stone furnace smelting setup altogether, going straight for steel furnaces, which consume only half the coal per plate smelted. We've carefully taken another 480 stone bricks, which will allow us to make another 48 steel furnaces for the left and right smelting arrays, but we don't have enough steel yet. So, instead of making our ever more urgently needed escape, we return inside once more to smelt some more steel. Finally, under the cover of a <laughs> Finally, under the cover of our last few gun turrets, We pull our car from our pants pocket and try to escape among the chaos of bantering biters, fierce forests and sturdy stones. Ouch, not an easy task to navigate our way out of. Of course, we immediately stumble upon what we are looking for. That seems suspiciously too good to be true. And it is, because this iron patch is still firmly inside of the pollution cloud. With evolution crossing into medium biters mere minutes from now, an iron mine here wouldn't stand up against the evolved biters for long. So, on we go. Eventually, we spot our first loot chest. And spent way too much time trying to claim the grand prize of... 3 iron chests. Well, as they say, you lose some, you miss some. The real prize is me taking the time to repair my car. Probably preventing me from losing it in the next inevitable mishap. 
Anyway, the water baller annoyingly starts to curve right back up towards our starting area. So, we are not making any progress so far. A tiny land bridge prevents a total exploration disaster. But as you see, we have driven straight back into the war platform's pollution cloud. And sizable attacks are being sent. Hopefully we will remain undetected here behind these trees. Anyway, although for a different reason than in the previous warp zones, we are again looking for a distant, unpolluted resource patch. But as we drive further and further out, the biter bases become larger, more numerous, and with much more dangerous worms. Also, this planet seems to be quite forested with a lot of lakes, which severely has been limiting my movement options. But fortunately, eventually we find the iron patch we are looking for. And after a quick scope of the surrounding area, we can start our electric mining adventure. But how? Where is the electricity going to come from? Well, my friend, this is Warptorio. We just warp it over through this warp harvester mining platform, which is the final blueprint for this stage of the game. Anything which is built on the platform stays on the platform, even if we pick it up, which means we can pick it up and put it down as we please in one single action. Despite the platform being super tiny, it is enough for our miners to be only partially built on the platform. And indeed, the four corner miners are just barely touching the mining platform with a single corner. The platform warps electricity over from the boiler floor, which powers the miners, and the warp loader warps the ore straight onto the harvester floor. Now, these miners are still gonna be making a lot of pollution, which will attract much unwanted attention from highly evolved biters soon. So, we will still need to protect our mines with some gun turrets. Unfortunately, those do not fit on the platform, which means we have to hope we don't forget to collect them before we warp out, or they will be lost forever, including the ammo inside. We don't need to worry about the miners though, Anything that is built on the platform will automatically warp back inside of our factory upon our departure from this planet to the designated mining platform place at the end of the harvester floor's hallways. Anyway, this is a good moment to talk about the harvester floor blueprint. As you see, we only have a 5 tile high area to work with, which means automating coal supply to the furnaces is out of the question. Between the full belt of iron ore coming in and the full belt of iron plates going out, there's just no more space. Fortunately, a steel furnace can run for 37 minutes on a single stack of coal, so hopefully we manage to keep them supplied by hand for now. And while inserters have no problem taking from the whole belt, they only give on the far side of the belt. So while the ore belt can just continue straight on, we need to do some old school belt side switcheroo to get the iron plates to the inside of the belt halfway through the furnace line. So if you are part of the OCD crew who immediately spotted the discrepancy in the inserter pattern, I know, it hurts my soul too. But because we somehow have to route a water pipe through that same 5 tile high area as well, I just didn't find another way. And the gun turret at the end should deal with any biters accidentally warping along with the mining platform. So, even though I said we won't be able to automate coal to the furnaces, there's a strange stack of three coal priority splitters at the end of the line, because indeed, we may not be mining iron all the time. Sometimes we may be mining other resources, like indeed coal. And those splitters will make sure the iron ore gets blocked completely and any coal will not be mixed in with the iron plates, but be routed through a different belt which leads to the boiler basement coal storage area. Anyway, with a full stack of coal per furnace and 9 chests of storage capacity for the iron plates, 
we can be sure the iron keeps flowing in until the moment we warp out. So, it's time to go find a copper patch. But first, let's go check out that loot chest we spotted upon arrival. Nine assemblers and a stack and a bit of iron gears. But the most important loot we got from this chest is revealing a copper ore patch on the edge of the map. It is very close to our biter nest though, so it remains to be seen if it is usable for us. Oh, well, correction, it is very close to two biter nests, plus there is another one close by in the south. We can still fit the mining platform on the southern tip of the ore patch though, but with the biters being this close by, we are going to get some significant attacks here for sure. Anyway, our 24 steel furnace stack can handle a full yellow belt of ore, but you need 30 miners to supply that, and our platform only fits 15. So why did we even bother to build the full 24 furnaces then? Well, we already researched 3 levels of mining productivity early on, which made the normally slow burner miners actually slightly outspeed the stone furnaces. But it doesn't stop there, we can get 2 more levels of mining productivity with red signs, and then 5 more levels with green signs. And with 10 levels of mining productivity, the bonus production equates to a full 100%. Which indeed means these 15 miners should be exactly enough to supply a full yellow belt of ore. Well, as soon as we manage to research those technologies. Anyway, after completing the copper mining platform, we go ahead and build up the copper smelter array, which can also be used to mine coal or even additional iron should we require so in the future. We also have a pipe leading in from this side, so we can hook up water to either the iron or the copper mining platform, or both at the same time even. Later on, we can repurpose one of these pipelines to oil. And there you have it, we have automated both iron and copper smelting. And we have automated power, from our buffered water tanks and coal chests. Let's quickly refill all the furnaces, so both sides are running on the same clock. And now that resources are actually accumulating automatically, it is finally time to complete the last step of this puzzle. The warp factory floor, where we will actually process said resources into the red and green science packs we so desire and require to progress. Next time. <laughs>